The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Say, what are our numbers actually consisting of? If they're all four characters, then these are the options we have. These are all the four character combinations decimal uh, uh, digit, a digit uh, the decimal point, and the minus sign distributed like this. These are all the four four character combinations we can have. Uh, for example, we won't have any negative numbers in our model here um, if you know, there's two digits um, before, before the decimal sign already, because otherwise we would have five. These are all the four um, character combinations we, we are looking at. And um, in a simple approach, you could say, um, if we now wanted to make this even more efficient, we have 12 symbols, right? We've got the zero to nine digits. We've got the decimal point and the minus sign. And to take it simple, we can say each of these is equally likely. That's probably not gonna be quite correct in reality, but close enough. So what that means is also here, these are uh, less likely than, than these guys because we had this distribution saying um, three quarters are positive values, those will be these ones, and one quarter of the numbers will be negative. These were the ones with the minus sign. So this makes up 20, 75%, this makes up 25%. The values, the different values that each of these can have are 100 for these because these two digits can be at 100 different values, uh, up to 1,000 you know, because these that have three decimal digits of course can have 1,000 different concrete values. And the uh, likelihood of these is then basically simply taking these, these um, probabilities of this constellation as a total and dividing it by the number of values that can have this. So every single instance of a number like minus 0.37 would have a likelihood of this, 0 0.00125. And you know a little uh, less down here because these have a thousand different values, but they're twice as likely in total. Uh, so what we're using here is basically the um, the fact that the information per alternative is p of i times log two divided uh, of, of one divided by p of i, and that gives us the next row in this uh, or column in this this table, which is now telling us how much information in bits is being passed by each of these. So this gives us the measurement of how many bits are being transmitted by each of these alternatives. And as we know, we just need to add these up. So we basically take the number of values that are available in this, in this, column, in this row here, 100 different values. Each of them has 0.012 bits of information content. So 0.012 times 100 gives you 1.2. So that's the overall value of information content in bits for this variant of the input. We do this for all of these, and we end up with these information contents of the various variants. If we add that up, we simply find out that if we do this slightly more detailed analysis here that shows that, that um, you know, these, for example, have a higher information content than these guys, we find that the information that the task requires is actually 11.4 bits per message. Note that we've now done a, um, a more detailed analysis than before. Before we said, hey, we just have these four, um, these 12 symbols, minus decimal point and the digits, and we assume they're all equally likely. If we do that, then we just get the probability of each being uh, 1 12th, of course, there's, because there's 12 different symbols, and that would simply give us um, four times log two of 12, 14 bits, right? Four characters times the information content of each of them, that would have been 14 bits. So what we've done on this slide is we've taken two approaches of estimating what's the actual information content that we provide to the interface taking a simple approach by eyeballing it, saying you know all the different digits are equally likely, we end up with 14 bits. If we take a closer look at the distribution of likelihoods, we find that the information content is actually less 
that is being transmitted. Okay. Now, since we now know what the information content of the message is that we are going to be providing, we can now take a closer look at um, how efficient could we be with different keyboards. If we do our interaction on a standard keyboard with 128 keys, then the efficiency is the 11.4 bits of the actual information that we provide to the system divided by the information that the user supplies. And with a 128 key standard keyboard, each key is basically a five bit um, information content, right? Because we've got 128, so log two of. Um... Oh, wait. <laughs> no, no. Um, where's the five bits coming from? Sorry. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Um, this is where. Of course, it would be seven bits if everything was equally likely. Um, but since the frequency of, of use varies a lot, um, this is an estimate just taking a little off the information content per key because the keys are by no means equally distributed in use. Right? Your uh, whatever paragraph sign or something or, or dollar sign is less likely than an E or an R or something like this. That's why we're currently working here with five bits. But this is, an, again, an estimate. Um, that would be very roughly around 50% efficiency. Now, if you take away this part, because we don't actually need this part of the inf interface to do the task. We only need the numerical keypad here with 16 keys, maybe, 4 by 4. Um, then you would have an information efficiency of 11.4 divided by 4 times 4 bits per key, right? A 16 key numeric keyboard. In this case, assuming that all of them are equally likely to be pressed. That's up to 70%. And if you make a dedicated keypad that doesn't even have a plus key or, or you know, the asterisk or the, the slash or this, this clear button anymore, you only need literally the 10 digits, the minus sign, and the decimal point because all, that's all you need to provide the information. No other keys on the keypad. Then all of a sudden, your information efficiency of the input device goes up to 80%. Why are we doing this? Well, because on the one hand, you can inf uh, optimize an interface by creating a better graphical UI to do the task. That's what we did at first with this analysis with the bifurcated interface. But you can also speed up a task by just removing input device options that the user doesn't need. If, this was, if you were really going to build a temperature conversion hardware box, you wouldn't give it a full ASCII keyboard, right? There will be lots of keys that are unnecessary that confuse the user that can lead to mis, uh, you know, mistakes in input or get hit accidentally. So you remove all the unnecessary stuff, you simplify the interface, keep it as simple as possible, and you're down to um, just having a 12-digit uh, or 12-key keyboard. So we can use both of these things. That both are based on information efficiency calculations to in improve um, user interfaces on the screen but also input devices. Um, I should explain, finally, what can I actually do with the theoretic content of a UI? Uh, should you always try to reach 100% efficiency? Probably not, because there are other considerations that you need to think of um, to make an interface good. It needs to be learnable and all these kinds of things. Um, it's like you, know, you can like you estimate the, the energy efficiency of a motor. You're not trying to reach exactly 100%. If you do, then congratulations, call Porsche or something. Uh, but it's an ideal aim to go for, and it gives you one more measurement you can apply to an analysis of an interface. You could say, well, this is what the users say about it. We got feedback from them, and, and here's some user studies of using it. But also, we know theoretically we are at 80% you know, efficiency here um, towards the, the theoretical optimum. Um, <coughs> so. It gives you one more thing for a UI to examine, to calculate, to measure, to factor into your design decisions. Um, real designs are always a compromise between lots of goals, and this can be one.
This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.